morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. I think we're going to get started. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone in the room and online to our very special Center for Healthcare Innovation Grand Rounds this morning. My name is Kate Sibley. I'm the Director of Knowledge Translation at the Center for Healthcare Innovation, uh, which is a partnership between the University of Manitoba, the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, and we are the CIHR SPORE support unit for the province of Manitoba. The University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And that spirit um, leads the way into our very special grand rounds today with Dr. Stephanie Nixon, uh, focusing on what every health researcher needs to know about health equity and giving us an introduction to privilege, oppression, and allyship. I've had the pleasure of knowing Stephanie for almost 10 years now, and I've recently crossed into the territory where I can no longer remember how we actually came to know one another. Um, we've it's just always been, and uh, although Stephanie and I have never worked together, I've always been a, a huge fan and had great respect for her approach and work, and it's a real privilege to have brought her here uh, to Manitoba today. Uh, Dr. Nixon is a physiotherapist who's been an HIV activist and researcher for over 20 years. She is an asso associate professor in the Department of Physical Therapy and the Dalla Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto as well as the director of the International Center for Disability and Rehabilitation at U of T. She conducted her PhD in public health at the University of Toronto and her postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Kuala KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. And so it's with great pleasure that I invite uh, Stephanie to present to us and look forward to a very engaging session. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone, in the room, online. I am very honored to be a guest in Treaty 1 territory, to be on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. There are many people joining us today from across Turtle Island, the land now known as North America, and I invite each of you, wherever you are, to pause and acknowledge whose land you're on. For many of you, this is easy. This is a question you know the answer to. There are many of you, however, for whom this is the first time you're invited to, be do, to do that personally. And if that's you, if this is the first time that you're being invited to think about whose land are you on right now, whose land did you grow up on, then this is a good day for you. This is an invitation for you to start your learning. The ideas that I'm going to be sharing today are not new. There is nothing new that I'm going to be sharing today. These are ideas that have been around for many, many years, uh, but not so much within the health sphere. And so what I will be bringing today is some new ways to talk about these, some new ways of translating this knowledge, but the ideas themselves are not new. It's taken me a long time to come to know uh, them as I do, and the learning has been not so much from within the academy as it's been from people uh, that are activists, people of color, racialized people, people with disabilities, people who are queer, trans, many people living with HIV, and I'm grateful to all of the learning I've had. I particularly would like to honor these five black and indigenous women who have been very generous in helping to build my capacity. So any ideas that you hear today that stick, that are good, that are important, these are ideas I'm translating from others. Any shortcomings today, those, those are my own. And then gratitude to the Center for Healthcare Innovation a partnership of the University of Manitoba and the uh, Winnipeg Regional Health Authority for making this possible for all of us, for, for giving me the space to have this conversation, for inviting all of you in the room to join us, and for making it possible for you online to be part of this conversation as well. I, I, I really take your gift uh, of an hour of your time seriously. Each of you has carved out this time in the middle of very, very busy days to build your own capacity. Uh, and I thank you for that. And to honor this gift of your time, I promise to do my very best to unsettle you, uh, in a good way, 
If this next hour goes as planned, we will be successful if, by the end, you feel unsettled, but also curious, and especially energized. Energized to want to learn more, to lean towards these ideas as opposed to pulling away. That's what we're up to this morning. So let's begin. Here's what we're doing today. We're talking about privilege, oppression, and allyship. So let's start in the most natural place, a 90-second video of people passing around basketballs. Now, you have one task as you watch this video, one task. Your job is to count the, how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Now, before we start this video, how many people in the room think they've seen this video before? So that's less than half. And what about online? How many people online think they've seen this video before? OK, so that's just less than half as well. That's great. Those of you <laughs> who have seen this before, I want you to watch it with a special eye. Here we go. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. You had one job. It was to get the number of passes right by a show of hands in the room and online. How many people got the number of passes right? How many people did not? And there's the honesty, at least half in the room and about a quarter online. Uh, now, right in the middle of the video, an adult dressed in a gorilla suit walked out, stood in the center of the screen, thumped his chest, and then walked off again. Again, a moment of truth and courage. How many people online and in the room did not see that gorilla? So we have about a dozen people and about 13 online. <laughs> and there were only three people wearing black shirts. One of them walked right off the screen. Did anybody miss that? So that's most of this room, yep. And then the entire backdrop changed color. The entire backdrop of the screen changed color. Is there anyone who missed that? So that's most of us again. All right, so what is this all about? This is one of many videos that you'll see uh, uh, on YouTube if you Google a psychological concept called inattentional blindness that I don't know anything about and is irrelevant for today's talk. Now, why I like this video is because of the metaphor that it offers for privilege and how privilege might operate in society. That there can be something as obvious, something as glaring as an adult dressed in a gorilla suit who can walk right in front of you thump his chest and then walk off again, and that it's possible not to see that. That something as obvious as the entire backdrop changing color, and yet it's possible not to see that. In fact, back to the gorilla, for the people who didn't see the gorilla, there is no chance that after watching this video, you would have a conversation with your friends about the gorilla, right? Because you never saw it. You would never take a course in gorillas on the screen because you just didn't know there was even something about gorillas to even care about. In fact, you might go so far as to hear other people talking about gorillas and to not believe them that it was a real thing because you had not actually seen it yourself. You may actually deny their claims to gorilla-ness. Yes? And so it is with privilege that it is as glaring as the entire backdrop changing color, as a person in a giant gorilla suit. It is as glaring as that to those who have built their capacity to see it, and yet can be completely invisible to others to the extent that they might not even believe that it's a real thing. But the good news is 
We can do something about this, right? Like, think about how I built your capacity at the start of this video. Remember I said, you have one job. I built your capacity to do one thing really well. Count the number of times the player's wearing white past the ball. I said it twice, it was written on the screen, and then the narrator said it as well. We still had only about two thirds of the people get that one right, but that was how we built your capacity, and it could have been otherwise. I could have said, this video is called the monkey business illusion for a reason. A giant monkey is gonna walk out in the middle. You have one job, it's to see the gorilla when it walks in the screen. We would have had 100% of the people see the gorilla. Or I could have said, this is complicated, there's gonna be a bunch of changes, we're gonna practice and make it possible to get really good at understanding the nuances of the changes in this video. Count the passes, see the gorilla, the screen changing color, the person, and we could practice and practice and get better at it to the point where you're really good at seeing that. And so it is with privilege. It is completely within our control to build our capacity to come to see how privilege operates in society and what it has to do with any of us, and that is exactly what we're up to today. Okay? Now this topic, privilege and oppression allyship, it matters in all kinds of spheres. We're coming together today, most of us, because of our interest in health. Some of us are health researchers, some of us are clinicians, others are working in other aspects of health, others are people who aren't even formally working in health but who care about health. And so you're joining in today to think about what these concepts have to do with each other. This is a report from 10 years ago, one of the many reports on the social determinants of health, but arguably the most important in recent past, is from the World Health Organization's Commission on the Social Determinants of Health. And right up front, they state, social justice is a matter of life and death. These inequities in health, avoidable health inequalities. Pause. It's uncontroversial that there are inequalities in health. However, frequently when we talk about these inequalities, they're taken as if they're natural, as if they're just normal, right? And what the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health is reminding us is that these health inequities are avoidable, that these are man and woman made, and can be man and woman unmade. Unpause. Avoidable health inequalities that arise because of the circumstances in which people work, live, age, etc. And it's the privilege and oppression aspects of these determinants that we're building our capacity in today. And so here's how I'm thinking about our conversation. I'm thinking about it as a stroll, where we're gonna take a bunch of steps together as we go, and the arc is gonna be according to these three aims. They're iterative and they're connected, but generally this is the arc that we're taking together. And the first is to really build our understanding of the concepts of privilege and oppression and what they have to do with health equity. The second is figuring out not just what do they mean out there, but what do they actually have to do with any of us, us personally, the spheres in which we operate. And the third is the most important, it's the so what we're learning this so that it can actually change the way we see the world, the way we walk through the world. So the third is to understand the principles of practicing allyship and why they matter. That's what we're up to. So let's begin. So the first step in our stroll starts with me acknowledging that for everyone on the line and everyone in the room today, it is a big deal that you're here. And not just because we're here to learn about an important topic, but it reflects something. It reflects that you have a life right now where there's time in it to care about this topic and to carve out time to come and do some capacity building. Many of you have uh, degrees, one, some of you many more. Uh, you've already arrived at quite an incredible point in your journeys, and I'd like to honor that. Now, most of you probably feel like, oh, maybe, but I'm still on my way places. I'm still going places, and that's true. But I would like to honor the fact that today, this moment, where we've arrived to is already a fantastic level of achievement, <laughs> more than most people in the country, certainly more than most people around the world in terms of educational status. That's uncomfortable for people to hear a lot of the times. So I'm just going to invite you to, to sit with it and say, yeah, you know what, where I am right now, it, it, is, it does show that actually I've traveled quite a successful path. And so what I'd like to do is to reflect on that path, each of us, and I want you to think about what would one example be of a facilitator or a strength or an asset that's helped you get to this point? 
And what would be one of the challenges or barriers that you've had to overcome or that you're still grappling with uh, to get to this point? And I'm going to give you a few moments online and in the room just to try and call up an example of each in your head. So your journey to where you are in your life right now, what's one of the facilitators that's helped you get there? What is one of the challenges that's made it difficult for you to get there? Take a moment to think of this on your own. Call up examples to the front of your mind. Keep mulling. I've had the chance to have this conversation with a lot of people, and I want to share with you some of the answers that I've heard. And probably some are going to reflect some of the things you're thinking, uh, but not all, and that's okay. So when I've asked people, what are some of the strengths that have helped you to get to where you are? Some people say, well, it's because of persevering. That's one of the things is I persevered. Others have talked about their access to a great education. Others have talked about how hard they had to work to make ends meet, or still in the theme of money, having access to financial support from friends or family or grants. And then in terms of barriers or challenges, some people have talked about the struggle of really not taking care of themselves, or having a major health challenge, or a family member having a health challenge, or lack of access to high quality, free health care, or being my own toughest critic. Yeah. Some people have talked about struggling to find strategies to fit in with others, or the challenge of not speaking English as a first language, or not being born in Canada, or the challenge of having too many passions. But other strengths have included mentors, finding great mentors out there, having great mentors around you. Some people have talked about being in a place where being gay is not illegal, or finding the courage to go for bold opportunities. And a lot of people often talk about uh, being black, or white, or indigenous, et cetera, et cetera. And to my friend Colin, who's helping us with AV today, if we can make sure that our friends online can see the screen right now and not me, that'll be helpful. Now here's what happened. I invited all of us to think about strengths and challenges that have helped us to get to where we are today. And then I shared with you some of the ideas that I've heard in the past that uh, probably reflect some of your ideas as well. If We won't do this now, but if I were to ask for uh, uh, contributions from your own experiences, I would take those contributions and I would assign them to one of these two columns, either on the left or the right, and I would be intentional about it. Because you saw what was going on here, didn't you? As this list was being created, I asked you for strengths and facilitators. But when I started talking about the strengths I heard, I didn't put them all in the same column. I put them in both columns. And then when I asked about the challenges, I also put those in both columns. And so what you've been figuring out is that while I asked you two questions, strengths and challenges, and then made two lists, these are not lists of strengths in one column and challenges in the other column, right? You follow that? Online you follow? So the question is, what are these lists of? The question is, what are these lists of? Can anyone help me? And this is tricky in a space like this. We're, for those online, we're in a big space. People are scattered all over. Uh, but who can help me out? So the invitation was that maybe on the left is internal and on the right is external. Good. Who can build on that? Yes. And based on the theme, the right one has privilege or lack of privilege. So based on the theme, the point was based on the theme, the ones on the right are privilege or lack of privilege. And you flag a nice point for us, which is that while I asked about strengths and challenges, do you see how each one of these in any category, in fact, could be a strength or a challenge? depending on your relationship to it, depending on whether you got it or not. I tried really hard. I didn't try hard at all. Right? I had access to grants. I didn't have access to grants. Any of those, each of these could be a strength or a challenge, depending on your relationship to it. And then you were inviting us to think about the column on the right has something to do with privilege. And who else can give language to this? How, what would be the, the headings or the descriptors of either of these columns? What's going on here? Yeah. If you have access to all the good stuff on the right, then you can focus on the good stuff on the left. 
So the point was, if you have a, there's something about how these lists are not only coherent in their own right, but that they're related to each other. That if you have access to the, 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 the factors on the right in a good way, if they work for you, then it can help you to uh, realize or make use of the factors that are on the left. Good. Anyone else want to help us make sense of these two columns? Yes. Good, so this is really helpful. The comment was that you have control over the things on the left and less control or no control over the things on the right. And I agree with all these answers. Uh, I would uh, say that the first list on the left is mostly individualistic, internal, uh, intrinsic. Sometimes that's how people talk about it. Whereas the factors on the left are more external, extrinsic. They're more social, societal, systemic, institutional, structural. And then this nice point just raised that the column on the left, these are more largely within one's control. Whereas the column on the right is not under an individual's control so much. And why does this matter, right? Why does this matter? It matters because brrr, five minutes ago, I started by inviting us to reflect on the very fortunate places we each find ourselves in our lives, right? Recognizing that even though we still have great, great journeys to travel, great new heights to reach, right now, right here today, we have already achieved an incredible amount. And then I invited us to reflect on what helped us get here. How do we get here and what got in our way? And we took a collection of ideas and organized them into two different types of lists. The list on the left, the things that were individualistic, the things that were within our control, the things that we actively did and had control over that helped us to get to where we are today. And on the right, the big list of factors that were less in our control, that we either lucked into or, if they didn't work in our favor, unlucked into. We didn't ask for it, we didn't earn it, but these factors on the right either gave us a lift, an unearned lift, or an unearned disadvantage, depending on who we happen to be. Right? So when I invited us to think about how is it that we got to where we are today, if it sounds like I'm proposing some of the factors that helped us to get we are, where we are, were within our own making, but that a good number of the factors that helped us to get to where we are actually were totally outside of our control, we did nothing to earn them, then that's exactly what I'm proposing. Right? And it, is tricky because it, it doesn't fit. This, this recognition does not fit with one of the dominant ways of thinking that if you try your hardest, you can be anything. Right? The American dream, pull up your bootstraps, all on the left-hand side, with very little recognition of the powerful, powerful influence of the other factors that shape chances for some in an advantaged way or a disadvantaged way. You follow? Folks online, you follow? Cancer Care Ontario? Yes, okay. So here's the gist of it. It's the idea that there are norms in society that work for or against people, right? The, the list on the right, uh, the right, that have nothing to do with individual merit, worth, or behavior, the list on the left. And if that was one step in our stroll, let's take another step in this stroll. And this step, this is a true story. This is not even an urban legend. This is an actual thing that happened to me when I was working with uh, a senior hospital executive, we had a huge amount of work to do in the next week. And on Sunday uh, evening, I get an email from him saying he'd had a skiing injury. He was out. He'd, so I'm a physiotherapist. So he had sustained a lower limb injury. And he wasn't going to be available for the next week. It was quite serious. And so I had one of those moments where I thought, oh, we're doomed. But then I got it together and wrote back saying, no problem. This will be fine. It's, I've totally got it. Take care of yourself. All will go well. He writes back the following email verbatim. He says, everyone I work with is being very accommodating. I notice when on the phone with high level university, ministry, or hospital, uh, hospital people that the fact that this occurred while skiing invariably registers as an acceptable way to enter into a temporarily disabled state. And he goes on to say, there seems to be a sense that an injury caused by engaging in a healthful activity, and a properly elitist one at that, is more worthy and welcomed than it otherwise might have been. So you're probably thinking, who writes like that? That is the weirdest email I've ever seen, right? And the answer is, 
someone who's been working on the gorilla. The whole work that we had to do in the next week was gorilla work. It was coming to see privilege. And so he'd been fine tuning his lens to see it. And it's Sunday night, he's sending out all these emails to these high level people, these high stakes things he was meant to be doing. And he gets this wave of emails back that were all, oh, no problem, take care of yourself. And he was just seeing gorillas everywhere. So this is him writing to me saying, Gorilla City, everywhere I look, I'm getting a free pass. This is incredible. And so I write back saying, that is so fascinating. May I turn that into a workshop activity? And he says, OK, good luck to you. Yeah. And so that's what we're going to do. What we're going to do together, online and in the room, is as follows. I am going to swap out one of his characteristics and swap in another. And what we're going to do as a collective is judge whether he would be more acceptable and welcomed, less, or the same. Now, this is a little tricky for a few reasons. The first is, it's not your own view I want you to channel here. It's channeling societal norms. So you're thinking, well, what does that mean? Who, who, who society? So I am going to invite us to suspend our concern for detail at this point and just say, out there, wherever you are, out there, out, out, out in the streets. That's what we're talking about now. Uh, and each time, we'll do a practice. Each time, the way it's going to work is that he, he happened to be a hospital vice president at the time. I'm going to give you time to think, and then I'm going to say one, two, three, vote. And the way it's going to work is I'll say, what if instead of being a hospital VP, he was a hospital cleaner? And if you think he would be more acceptable and welcomed, you're going to do thumbs up. If you think less, it's going to be thumbs down. And if about the same, you're going to do an open hand. One more detail. The fascinating thing about this activity is that there is going to be 100% participation. <laughs> because it would be horribly embarrassing to be the person in the room or online who didn't vote. That would be awful for you. So we'll make sure you have enough time that your vote is organized, you feel confident and ready to go. But that's what's going to happen. And we're going to march through a whole bunch of these slides. And we're just going to see what patterns happen. So, this is just a pilot. This is going to be our practice run. Channeling societal norms, not your own values. How acceptable and welcomed would he be if instead of a hospital VP, he was a hospital cleaner? Organize your vote. One, two, three, vote. Now, in the room, we have almost exclusively thumbs down. And online, we have about 90% thumbs down and this many of that. Now, what if instead of being a hospital VP, he was a nurse? Organize your vote. One, two, three. We have almost a lot of that and some of this and the same pattern online. OK, pause. I have a confession to make. I cannot see you online. <laughs> it turns out I can only see people in the room. But there are so many wonderful people joining us online. It's important that we're engaged. So what I'm going to do is continue to pretend that I can see you so that we can have a sense of closeness and connection. And I know that some of you are gathered in rooms where it's not just you, but you're actually with a few other people watching. All right, so you can just look at each other and make sure they're participating too. So here we go. What if instead of a hospital VP, he was actually a rich hospital donor about to have a wing named after him? Organize your vote. One, two, three. Online, in the room, things are looking up for this guy. Now this is also true. He's a physician who was trained in Canada. What if instead of being a doctor trained in Canada, he had been trained in Nigeria and was seeking a practice license in Canada? Organize. One, two, three, vote. We have... Mostly this, some of this. Now, this is also true. He identifies as straight. What if instead of being straight, he was gay? Organize. One, two, three, vote. We have some thumbs up, mostly flat. Now, it's also true that he identifies as cisgender. And I'm going to ask you, what if instead of being cis, he was trans? But I've not been in a room yet where everyone has already known what the term cisgender means. And you need to understand that term in order to be able to vote, right? So if it's OK, I'm just going to take a moment to explain the term cisgender so that all of us have a good working knowledge of this important term. So cisgender and transgender <clears throat> are two different ways of being that are related to the match between the sex someone is assigned at birth and the gender they grow up feeling inside. When there's a match, that person is cis. When there's not a match, that person is trans. So a little babe is born. 
handed to the mom, and the healthcare provider says, it's a girl. If that little person grows up feeling inside like a girl, that little person is cis or cisgender. But it's a girl, and that little person grows up either feeling like a boy or feeling not girl, right? Because there's options other than just boy or girl. So it's a girl, that little person grows up feeling not girl, that person is trans. Or it's a boy, and that little person grows up feeling boy inside, cis. It's a boy, and that little person grows up feeling either like a girl or just not boy, trans. I'm cis. Right? I was assigned female sex at birth, and I grew up feeling like a girl. So I am cis. Sometimes, if you think about each of the earlier slides, there's a, they're just different ways of being, aren't they? But sometimes they're more valued. So there's gay and there's straight and other options as well, of course. Uh, but they're just different ways of being. But one gets to be a bit more valued or much more valued. Sometimes different ways of being, cis and trans, one of them, even though they're just different ways of being, one of them becomes so much more valued as to be taken not as just a different way of being, but actually becoming natural, being taken as if it is just the right natural way to be, such that it doesn't even need naming. Yeah? There's only trans, there's only difference. There's not just two different ways of being. You do not need to vote on this one. Life is way easier if you're cis. Now, before this lower limb injury, he was considered able-bodied. What if instead of being able-bodied, he had a visible disability? Organize your votes. One, two, three, vote. So mostly thumbs down. What if instead of being able-bodied, he had an invisible disability, maybe related to mental health or learning? Organize. One, two, three, vote. And we have mostly down, a little bit straight across. Now, it's also true that he identifies as white. Turns out, there is no real biological thing as white. Right? Whiteness is not a real thing. Blackness is not a real thing. There's difference in skin tone. That is the biological basis. There's not a DNA test for whiteness or blackness. These are social and political ideas. And what counts as white, right here, right now, I count usually as white, but what counts as white right here, right now, is different than what counted as white right here, right now, 50 years ago. And it's probably different than what will count as white in 50 years. And what counts as white right here, right now, is different than what counts as white in other parts of the world right now. All right, so just inviting us to unsettle whiteness for a minute. Uh, he identified as white. He was read as white. What if instead of being white, he was considered someone who was a person of color or racialized? Okay, organize your vote. One, two, three. We have some down, a lot of straight across. Now, this one is what he, he was considered someone who has no accent. To be clear, no accent is nonsense. There's no such thing as no accent. <laughs> There's a standard accent. There's the way I happen to pronounce my words right now, which is typically taken as the standard accent where I work in Toronto and probably here in Winnipeg as well. Uh, but it's different than what, than what counts as no accent right here 50 years ago and different 50 years from now. It's different than what counts as no accent right now somewhere else in the world. Are you with me? It's just a different way of pronouncing words. And yet, the way I'm talking right now gets to count as no accent, you see? It's... So what if instead of having no accent, a standard accent, he had a Pakistani accent? Organize your vote. One, two, three, and online. So we see mostly down, a little bit across. And to be clear, there's not just one Pakistani accent, right? There's loads of Pakistani accents. Now, what if instead of having no accent, he had a British accent? Organize your vote. One, two, three, vote. Things are, oh, thumbs up. Things are looking way better for this guy. What if instead of having no accent, he had a British working class Cockney accent? You're saying, I don't know. What does that mean? And what did that? <laughs> it's OK. So what's the point of all of this? What is the point of all of this? The point is that with every single one of these slides, our voting online and in the room was never a three-way split. There was always a pattern. There was rarely 100% consensus, but there was always a pattern, mostly down a little across, mostly across a little up, et cetera, et cetera. 
And yet every single one of these characteristics were characteristics from the list on the right, right? They were social, institutional. We know nothing about whether this guy was a good guy, earned, or you know, he's helped us out so much in the past we should give him a break now, whether he's a jerk. Right? We know nothing about his actual merit, worth, or behavior to earn our thumbs up or our thumbs down or our thumb across. It was all based on factors that are largely out of his control. And yet we really were able to demonstrate the pattern of whether he would have an easier time or a harder time based on these ideas from the list on the right. Do you follow? At home, you follow? So these are complicated concepts. Sometimes, though, we can find a way to get our heads around it in a more simple way. And I'd like to propose that we could use the metaphor of a coin, a coin, to help us get our heads around this. Uh, specifically, the coin itself is the social pattern, is the social structure, is the item from the list that was on the right. That is not about good or bad people. It's about a social pattern that's in place that we don't get to opt into or out of, it just is, that either gives unearned advantage or unearned disadvantage, depending on your relationship to it. So if this coin, give, you're on the bottom of the coin, you have a disadvantage that others don't. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. You didn't earn it. You just have it because of who you happen to be. The corollary is that if your relationship to this coin is that you're on the top, you have a benefit an advantage that others don't. You didn't earn it. You frequently didn't ask for it. You frequently don't even know you're getting it, but you get it all the same. Because it's not by choice, it's because of who you happen to be. And so this bottom of the coin, I call, in this framing, oppression. And what do I call the top of the coin? Privilege, yeah. These could be tricky terms to get one's head around, and they're used differently in different settings. I'm offering a way of thinking about this that's very particular, where the coin itself is the social structure, and the people who relate to it by being on the bottom receive unearned disadvantage or oppression, or relate on the top unearned advantage or privilege. And the coin is not one coin for all privilege and oppression ever. Every single coin is a different one of these social patterns. So the coin could be classism, racism, sexism, ableism, heterosexism, and on and on and on and on and on the coins go. And this matters for a lot of reasons, but it especially matters for us working in health because these forces don't just shape people's jobs. They also shape who's healthy, who's ill, who gets injured, who accesses health care, the kind of care people get, these forces determine, influence, and in certain cases determine who lives and who dies. These are the avoidable health inequities that the WHO Commission on the Social Determinants of Health were pointing us to. And so what does this have to do with health equity? So in this image, you can see we have the coin with privilege on the top, oppression on the bottom. And frequently when we talk about health equity, we talk about it as if it's a single point. But it's relational, isn't it? It's something compared to something else. So I'm inviting us to imagine health equity as across the coin, the bottom of the coin, compared to the top. And when we think about groups of people who are disadvantaged by social structures, so people on the bottom of the coin, Di different groups whose health is worsened because of these social structures, what are some of the general terms that we give to people who would be on the bottom of the coin? What comes to mind for you of the types of ways we would refer to people on the bottom? Yes? Marginalized. Marginalized, marginalized groups, marginalized populations. What else? Vulnerable. Vulnerable groups or populations. What else? Low income. Low income. Underserved. Underserved. Hard to reach. Hard to serve at risk, and we could keep going, right? Here's a few that you came up with as well, marginalized populations, disadvantaged communities, high-risk groups. I want you to think back to all the health research you've been involved in, the health promotion activities, the health education activities. What are the common names that have been used, common terms used in all of those settings when we talk about the people who receive health benefits from the unearned advantage, the privilege, the unearned privilege they receive from these same social structures, what are the really common terms that we give to people on the top of the coin? 
If you can't think of any, <laughs> I'm with you. I propose we don't have terms for groups of people. In fact, it's invisibilized. It's disappeared that there might be a top of the coin. And frequently, when we're doing health equity and health promotion work, we not only disappear that there is a top of the coin, we actually disappear the coin itself. The social structure, the social system that is causing this unearned advantage and disadvantage frequently gets invisibilized as well. And the focus ends up exclusively being working on the health needs of marginalized populations. Now, of course we should be working on the health needs of marginalized populations. This is deeply unjust, right? There needs to be robust, comprehensive responses to the needs of people on the bottom of the coin. But what are the implications for health equity work if we disappear people on the top of the coin and disappear the coin itself? Why does that matter? It matters because what we set as the problem or the issue in the first place automatically sets the universe of possible solutions that will follow. What we set as the problem in the first place automatically sets, delimits the universe of possible solutions and responses that can follow. If we only ever understand the problem in health equity to be the people on the bottom of the coin, we will only ever advance solutions to address that legitimate concern. But it does not follow that we will also come up with strategies that deal with the coin itself or deal with the problem of the people receiving unearned advantage on the top. Yes? You know what this is? It's the gorilla. It's the gorilla, and it is very hard to see something that isn't there. It is very hard to read in an article when something's been invisibilized. It's very hard to hear it in a news story if it's not there until you fine tune your lens to expect it, to fine tune your lens to come to see it. So the next time you're hearing a story about a marginalized group, listen carefully. Where's the coin? Where are the people on the top of the coin as part of this broader issue? Right? Come to see the gorilla. Now, we've been moving at quite a clip, and we've covered some heavy material. Uh, it pains me to deliver a largely didactic talk. I much prefer to do this kind of work in a workshop forum. In fact, there's a collective of us who are going to spend four hours later doing this type of work, slowing down and digesting. Uh, so in the spirit of just a tiny nod to the principles of adult education, I want you to take a moment, reflect on the ideas that we've explored, and just in your own mind, call to the front of your head one important insight you've had so far. Just 10 seconds, call forward one important insight you've had so far, important for you. Think on your own. It's time for the next step in our stroll. So these lofty abstract ideas about privilege and oppression, let's try to make them more real. All right, let's try to bring it down to the ground a bit more. Um, even if we can get our head around what these coins might be, typically, my experience has been in health that we are so underdeveloped in our capacity for analysis of these things that it's very hard to even give language to who would be on the top and bottom of these coins. So we're going to move through a few coins trying this out. Racism. Who's on the top of the coin of racism? People who are white. Right. There was a long time when I thought racism meant people of one race being mean to people of another race. That's not it at all. all right? If it is the first time that you're being invited to understand that racism is a social structure where the people on the top, the people who receive unearned advantage from racism as white people, then again, this is a good day. This is an important day. And who's on the bottom of the coin? People who are not white. And it gets way more complicated than that, right? There's all kinds of other coins that are made possible by this coin of racism in terms of the way that different types of racialized people are positioned. Uh, to each other, but fundamentally I'm concerned today with unearned advantage or privilege. So we're going to focus today on the fact that the top of the racism coin is people who are white. 
Now, how, the next point is ableism. How many people online in the room have even heard of the term ableism before? So that's about half. If this term is new to you, this is a good day. This is your day, this is your invitation. Every single one of us, whether we work in ability, disability, rehabilitation or not, should have a very good working knowledge of this term. It's just like racism in the sense of being a social system that presumes that some people are the natural right way of being and that others are not. And who's on the top of the ableism coin? People who are able-bodied, right? And considered to be able-bodied. There's not a real able-bodiedness. Right? It's, there's real impairments, different ways of doing things, but what gets to count as the right way, like those of us wearing glasses, that's okay, we're still on the top for some reason, that doesn't count as disability. Uh, but those for whom the social structure of, of disability puts them on the bottom, they receive unearned disadvantage. Heterosexism, who's on the top of that coin? People who are straight, yeah, or heterosexual. And who's on the bottom? People who are not straight. Again, this gives rise to different other types of coins where it gets more complicated. Uh, settler colonialism. How many people in the room feel like they could explain what that term means? I won't make you. <laughs> there, there's about a, maybe 10 or so people in the room. And online, we've got, oh, quite a few more online. So this is bit, well done. Uh, settler colonialism. Who is it that's advantaged, uh, disadvantaged by settler colonialism? Who's on the bottom of the coin? People who are indigenous. But all the time when we talk about indigenous health, there goes, sometimes there might be mention of the coin, but frequently the top of the coin, it's gone, isn't it? Indigenous health, that inequity, is framed as if it's something that happens exclusively to indigenous people. And then anyone who's not indigenous that wants to get involved is, wants to do so because of altruism, because of caring. And while that might be the, the legitimate urge they have, here's the important part of the story. There's a top of the coin. The same structures, the Indian Act, residential schools, all of the structures in that broad sweeping Indian Act legislation that have limited the rights and power and movement of indigenous people, those same structures have given unearned advantage to not indigenous people. And frequently it gets framed as if it's people of white settler descent, which it is, who enjoy both the unearned advantage of settler colonialism and the unearned advantage of racism. But it applies also to people of color who are not indigenous, who also have access to benefits by being not indigenous. Right? And classism, people who are upper or middle class and people who are poor. Now all of this matters because where privilege is unchecked, all right, where we don't realize there's a coin and that we might be on the top of it, where that is unchecked, it leads to a totally irrational sense of expertise and access. Because when you think about the coin, and let's pick racism for instance, who's expert in terms of how racism operates day to day in life? If you ask someone on the bottom of the coin, tell me about the ways that racism, you know, the microaggressions and worse, interfered with your, your life this week, versus asking someone on the top of the coin, how is it that racism benefited you? What are the unearned advantages you received from racism this week? Who has more expertise? Right? It's people on the bottom of the coin. Ableism, who can, <laughs> able-bodied people, in what ways did your ableist privilege benefit you this morning? Or a person on the bottom of the coin, in what ways did, ableist, did ableism disadvantage you this morning, get in your way? And they'd say, how much time have you got? Or settler privilege, right? In what ways has settler colonialism benefited us today alone? if we happen to be non-indigenous? Like these are questions that are very difficult and, and not typically asked, right? Whereas people on the bottom of the coin are typically fully expert in this. They, they see this stuff so clearly. And yet, people on the top of the coin typically are ones that are holding control of money, resources, power, decisions, with an irrational sense of expertise, a feeling that we're, we're there because of the list on the, on the left, right? We got there off our own making, not understanding all the free lifts that helped along the way and the humility that comes with that, the respect for expertise, that if what we wanna do is dismantle this unjust inequity, this coin, that the real experts are the people on the bottom, not the top. Now, can people be on the privilege side of some coins and the oppression side of other coins at the same time? Can you do that? Yeah, lots of nods in the room, lots of nods online. Yeah, of course. Uh, that's all of us, 
all the time, right? We're on the top of some coins and we're on the bottom of other coins. And so I'm showing a, a cartoon on the screen here where there's a racialized guy in a wheelchair, a white guy, able-bodied, goes by and pats him on the head. And the guy in the chair says, I don't know whether I'm being patronized for being black or disabled. Work out in your head what this has to do with the coin metaphor, the, that framework. He's saying, I'm on the bottom of the racism coin, and I'm on the bottom of the ableism coin, and I don't know whether this guy who's on the top of both of those coins is patronizing me because of that coin or that coin, but I'm being patronized nonetheless. And what he's inviting us to think about here is how it's not just that these coins operate in isolation. It's that they intersect. And this is what some people would be referring to when they talk about intersectionality. Intersectionality. So it's not enough just to get our head around that there are coins. It's crucial to understand that all of us inhabit positions on the top of some coins and the bottom of other coins, and that the mixture is going to matter, and it will matter differently in different contexts, but it matters nonetheless. And this core concept was introduced by Kimberly Crenshaw, Patricia Hill Collins, and has been advanced by many others. And the gist of it is that it's not just the one plane, it's two planes, right? And in this particular version, I'm showing a picture of the coin where we have the plane of racism and the plane of ableism, and that the guy in the chair was on the bottom of both, the guy walking by was on the top of both. But it's not only those, right? We add in now the plane for being straight or not straight, indigenous, not indigenous. If the guy walking by was poor, but the guy in the chair was moneyed, that would make a different story again. Cis, trans, male, female. And again, each of these does not operate uh, equally. They will operate very differently and amplify things differently depending on the context that you're in. Okay. So we're gonna do a little jump here. Now some of the challenges to this, it's one thing just to get your head around the coin and then to have to get your head around the intersectional nature of these systems of inequality. But once you can say, okay, there's that big picture, I would like to understand it better, then we need to zero back in again because each of these systems of inequality, while they share similarities, they also operate quite differently. And so there's a huge, deep amount of learning that's required to come to understand how each of these systems of inequality operate. And as a very small example in this, of racism, I invite you with this picture of a Band-Aid to spot the gorilla. Can you spot the gorilla? Yes. Skin color. Yeah, skin color. That we have Band-Aids that match the color of skin that I've got, right? And that's historically what they look like. And you can now get Band-Aids that also look like cartoons or are purple, but it's still very, very rare to find Band-Aids that match the color of skin for anyone who is not white. That's how deeply entrenched and normalized the idea of whiteness is as just the right way to be. So what? Right. So where does this lead all of us? We've woken up these new ideas. What to do with them, this is the most important part, on today's stroll is getting to this piece at the bottom, this introduction to the principles of practicing allyship. And the gist of it is this. If you want to work towards dismantling an inequity, all right, dismantling one of those coins, if that is your goal, then different actions are appropriate depending on your relationship to that coin. Okay? If you want to dismantle that coin and you, your position related to it is the bottom, then you do not need this workshop. You do not need me telling you what to do. You, there are outstanding movements, right? It is racialized people who have moved and, and done the great activism to dismantle racism. It is disabled people who have led the great charges to dismantle ableism. Right? It's queer people who are leading the charges to dismantle heteronormativity. Those are the experts. However, for the many coins from which I and all of us find ourselves on top, this is the moment. All right? What is the different approach that should be expected from people on the top of the coin if the goal is to dismantle that coin? And I call it practicing allyship. It's not being an ally, it's not an identity, it's not a moment, and it's not self-defined. It is practicing allyship. It is a practice. It is an approach to walking through one's day. 
and there are many dimensions to practicing allyship, but I'd like to introduce you to one as a start. This frames allyship as an active, consistent, and arduous, difficult practice of unlearning. This is far more about unlearning taken for granted truths than it is about learning new things. And reevaluating in, in which a person in a position of privilege seeks to operate in solidarity with a marginalized group of people. In solidarity with, if you're on the top of the coin and you want to dismantle the coin, the approach is to operate in solidarity with people on the bottom of the coin, not in the spirit of trying to save, help, or fix them. And seeing the gorilla, seeing the coin and being on top of it makes possible a reframing of the problem that can help us access this approach to solidarity. And it goes like this. Before, I, this is me before, me earlier in my career, before I use my expertise on the top of the coin to help marginalize populations, people on the bottom of the coin, to deal with health inequities. Right? That's the irrational sense of expertise, that I am the one that should be helping those people on the bottom. Instead, here's the reframing I'm inviting you to imagine in your own work. I use the expertise of people on the bottom of the coin to help me on the top of the coin address health inequities, the coin, by working with other people in positions of privilege on the top of the coin. So this core principle is to stop wanting to dismantle the coin by rushing in to help save or fix people on the bottom, and rather stepping back and committing first to doing less harm, less harm by resisting the urge to help. And frequently, I have the following conversation right after long workshops on this, because this is so entrenched that the right way to dismantle this inequity is to help those poor, helpless people on the bottom. It is so deeply entrenched that I frequently have this conversation. It goes like this. A workshop participant who finds herself on the top of the coin comes to me afterwards and says, I understand what you're saying, and I'm trying to figure out how I can do less harm when working with people who are indigenous, racialized, disabled, in a low-income country, queer, poor, et cetera, et cetera, right? Any bottom of the coin. And I say, well, if you want to do less harm, then stop trying to help them. And she says, OK. But how should I approach them to be less harmful? And I say, are you approaching them to help? Then stop, don't do that. And she says, OK, but then how can I work with them? Right? You see the struggle to distance oneself from needing for the, the urge to rush in and help the bottom of the coin. So I go on to say, why do you think you should work with them in the first place? And she says, what do you mean? And I say, I'm inviting you to reflect on why it is that this group is framed as the problem in need of your help in the first place. She pauses and then, oh, the gorilla. You're saying that maybe it's people on the top of the coin, like me, that could be the problem. And I should try to help them. And I say, that would be a good step in your journey of practicing allyship. And she says, and if I want to collaborate with people on the bottom of the coin, it shouldn't be to help them. It should be to work in solidarity with them. And I say, yes. And then comes the next pause where she says, so, well, then how will I know when it's the right time to work in solidarity with people on the bottom of the coin? And I say, when they invite you. And so we close today by hearing the voice of an indigenous activist. This quote is commonly credited to Lilla Watson, where she says, if you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Thank you very much. Stephanie, I don't know where the hour went. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're right on our time schedule for today. So I'm going to thank everyone for attending, both in the room and online. Those who are attending in the room uh, will be sent an electronic survey link that will be emailed out after the rounds. Uh, please fill this 
that information out. And once again, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Nixon, for your very engaging and inspiring and unsettling uh, talk. And I hope everyone has uh, something that they can take away with them today. So one more round of applause. Thank you so much. And with that, thanks everyone. Have a great day.